mentioned earlier, we have Michael Towerman with us today, who is co-founder and a principal partner with TriStar Properties, which is the developer of the Gateway Commerce Center. And as I was looking for programs, um, I, I've always wanted to learn more about the Gateway Commerce Center. And I can I moved to Edwardsville in 97. It was interesting. I read that they started in 96. So I think I can remember the, like, the first building that was there going, wow, what's this all going to be? And it, I just think it's been amazing over the years. It just seems to be consistent and constant growth there. And uh, once in a while, when I go over there and try to find uh, one of our clients, it's always interesting. There's so many roads there. It's almost, I, it's almost a city within a city. And as Tim mentioned, there, there's a big impact locally for employee for employment as well as just a contributor to our economy. So a little bit about Michael. He began his career in 1983 as a real estate attorney and entered the real estate development field in 1988. Since then, he's been responsible for development over a billion dollars of property in multiple different asset classes, including the development of Gateway Commerce Center, which is one of the largest industrial parks in the United States. Uh, apartment complexes, office parks, shopping centers, and residential subdivisions um, in the area. Prior to co-founding TriStar in 1996, Michael was vice president of a nationally recognized shopping center development company. Michael has a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in business administration from the University of Missouri and a Juris Doctorate from the Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. So if you'd please help me welcome Michael and to tell us a little bit more about the Gateway Commerce Center. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. I hope you had a nice meal, and I hope I can share some things with you that are of interest and uh, worthwhile, worth your time. I'd also like to thank Tim Har for his kind words, and whatever I've done for the community, uh, what I saw Tim do, and the extent to which he was helpful in seeing our project come to fruition, I, I really cannot say enough about the support, information, <laughs> It's just a, just a total pleasure to deal with. And I was uh, happy to see him retire for his own sake because that's what he wanted to do. But I've sorely missed him ever since. Um, I have a few thoughts jotted down and um, I'll share my screen with you to give you kind of an aerial of the property so you can uh, see from a bird's eye view what's out there and who some of our major tenants are. Um, I was just gonna cover a few facts about Gateway. Uh, what made this all possible, uh, obstacles that we've run into, yet how we resolve some of those obstacles. And I wanted to make sure that this was fairly brief so that uh, you're free to ask questions and we're pretty much an open book and uh, we'll share virtually anything that you ask. And um, that way you get to hear what you wanna hear rather than what I think you wanna hear. Uh, so Tim mentioned that many jobs have been created out there and uh, kind of our mantra from the outset uh, was jobs and taxes, um, because I think when you bring a new and different type of project to a community, the community is probably interested in, well, how is this good for us? So uh, whether we're doing an industrial park of which we've done uh, a handful uh, whether we're doing an apartment complex, an office building or whatever, we try to keep in mind, how is this gonna impact the neighborhood and what will it do for the community? If we're obviously like many things in life, if we're focused on what's in it for us, um, that's, uh, that's, that's not in our opinion, the appropriate way to approach things. And in that regard, I, if you don't mind a quick little commercial for someone I highly respect, uh, there's a uh, author by the name of uh, Alex Grant, he's a professor at Wharton University, he's wrote a bestseller called Give and Take. And I believe in what he wrote. And he, he, he does a statistical analysis uh, with many uh, anecdotes in the book about uh, people who are givers, people who are takers, and people who reciprocate. Um, I think it's fascinating and easy read and I would recommend it. In any event, with regard to Gateway, I understand that there are about 6,000 jobs now out there. Um, uh, on the property tax uh, issue, when we bought the property, I'm sure there were less than $30,000 a year being paid in property taxes. There are about 2,300 acres out there, but it was all being farmed and you know, agricultural taxes are not substantial. Today, property taxes are several million a year. As of five years ago, uh, when we looked, the school districts alone were receiving more than $3 million a year. And I think that augments the city, the, the school district that's, that's Edwardsville and uh, Granite City. 
I think that has augmented the financial condition of those school districts because just the nature of the jobs that are down there and the number of people who commute to come to work in Gateway, uh, I don't think they're putting many uh, students in the school district. Uh, those taxes grow, by the way, every year for two reasons. One is we have tax abatement for a period of time and as the tax abatement uh, diminishes, uh, more and more taxes are being passed through to those taxing districts. For the time being, whenever we have tax abatement, uh, we, we, th that passes through to the tenants. We don't capture those, those property taxes. That's, that was an inducement in part for those tenants to come into the community. Uh, some, I know, I know that can be kind of a hot button. You know, do we need to give our taxes to big companies such as Procter & Gamble, uh, uh, Unilever and the like? Uh, it's not my choice. It's the nature of the way the economic development game is played. And that also reminds me of Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. And I think in the very beginning of the book, he talks about, you know, why do people stand up at a football game or a baseball game? Because someone in front of them stood up. If everybody stayed seated, then there wouldn't be a, a need to stand up. And similarly, if other communities were not offering tax incentives, uh, we wouldn't need to give tax incentives. But since they are, uh, the biggest, by the way, the biggest competitor we had at the outset of Gateway was Indianapolis, still a very strong competitor. They give routinely 10 years of tax abatement. So we were not going to attract regional industry uh, to the St. Louis metropolitan area if we did not offer something similar. So anyway, I so said there are two reasons why taxes grow every year. One is uh, abatement burning off. The other is that we're adding between one and two million square feet of new buildings each year, which in turn means more property taxes ultimately. Um, it started off very slowly, which I'll describe in a moment, and it took some while, a while to get some traction. And when people ask me about Gateway Commerce Center, I like to say, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years later, we're an overnight success. Uh, so like many other things, you start slowly, you build a market, and eventually you have some critical mass. And uh, I never really would have thought that um, we would attract the types of tenants and investors that we have. Uh, today, there are many pension funds, insurance companies, and private equity funds who have invested in buildings in Gateway. Most recently, we sold the uh, Worldwide Technologies buildings. We did a global technology center um, and a global logistics center. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to find a, give me just one second. I'm not good at multitasking. I understand that's really a misnomer. You know, can we really multitask? I know I can't. So I'm gonna show you an aerial of Gateway. So I understand that uh, also that you're thinking about, um, uh, you're thinking about touring the Worldwide Center. And I, I can tell you, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. If you can see my uh, cursor of this first building closest to Highway 255, uh, that is a, the Global Technology Center. And it actually is an office building, a data center, and a warehouse all in one. The uh, second building to the east, that's, that's their Global Logistics Center. Uh, fascinating, the company's tremendous to work with. You may very well know that, um, that they employ many people. They have an arrangement with uh, SIU Edwardsville. So they employ many of the graduates coming out of there. Uh, and they're very happy with their workforce. So overview of the park, you can see uh, I-255 or highway, I should say 255 running through the middle. Uh, we built this interchange at Gateway Commerce Center Drive where the county ditch goes through. We started over here on 111 and kind of worked our way from east to west. And uh, what I was gonna say about, um, uh, about worldwide technologies and the critical mass that we've reached, um, We've gone so far now that when we sold those worldwide buildings in January, uh, they were purchased by the second largest private equity fund in the world um, for well, well into nine figures. I mean, it really has, the, the, the institutional world has, has really uh, surprised me. And it's, it's wonderful to see those types of companies investing in your community. Uh, so what made this possible? Well. Um, I have a business partner, of, uh, this is our 25th year together, and uh, thanks to him, and uh, we have kind of a yin and yang going on here because he's an intuitive decision maker. 
So he just had this gut feel that if we came into this area, uh, which had a nice highway system and it seemed, and you could assemble large flat tracts of ground that could be developed, not easily, which I'll elaborate on in a moment, um, that we could create something that is sizable here. Um, and uh, we thought that was possible because of 111, 255, and 270. Uh, we had the interchange at 111, which great, gave us great access. Um, the potential to build an interchange right off of 255, that was great. Uh, so we saw kind of the bones of what could be built here, but he was the one who really had the vision and pushed me to go forward. Frankly, I was somewhat of a disbeliever uh, when he first approached me, and I think it was a few years before I saw signals that led me to believe that there was a real future and we were onto something. Um, so while he's intuitive, you know, I'm more of the type that uses, I collect information, use deductive reasoning, I I try to project and then make a decision, uh, but and we needed both to put the project together. It was, you know, his concept, his vision, and then it was uh, me and a team of other people, kind of just doing everything you need to take it from uh, what it was back then uh, to what it is today. Uh, there were some things that the state and the community did, uh, local units of government. Uh, that made this possible. It was number one, the foresight of completing the 255 loop, which was huge and done, completed shortly before, uh, shortly before we arrived on the scene. And 270, which seems to be under a constant improvement all the way to the Mississippi River was a big deal. Um, what I really enjoyed uh, and what really makes the business rewarding are the relationships that we get to build with people along the way. And that began with, um, with Gary Niebuhr, who was mayor uh, at the time, Jim, and Jim Pennekamp. And um, they, they welcomed us uh, as if we were ambassadors or something. It was really quite surprising and, and, and wonderful. Um, and uh, for several years, we worked together as a team. Uh, when we would bring prospects to town in the early years, Gary and Jim would meet me over at Sunset Hills and we'd have lunch in a beautiful environment. We'd show them what a wonderful community Edwardsville is. And uh, that was a big part of the selling process early on. Um, it was also the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity who did great things for us. Uh, we were able to get an appointment with then Governor, uh, Jim, I think it was Jim Edgar, at the time, um, and we actually met in his private office, gave him a, well, it wasn't PowerPoint back then, I think it was a slide presentation, and uh, that enabled us to get tax abatement by having a, an enterprise zone designated for Gateway Commerce Center, and I thoroughly enjoyed that meeting right until the time when I'm gathering up my stuff to leave, and the governor, I guess, was trying to make conversation with me, and he asked me if I carried my partner's briefcase as a rule, uh, so anyway. Uh, we also had the support of local taxing districts. So the enterprise zone gave us a license to go get tax abatement with the consent of the taxing districts. So we set up meetings with each of them. I think there were about 16, made our presentation. There was some pushback, but ultimately they, uh, they came to believe that if they let us give the incremental property taxes over and above what would be paid uh, beyond agricultural taxes, to these companies in order to induce them to come into the area in the short run, we would help develop a substantial tax base for decades to come. Well, now the submarket, which is not only Gateway, but the new park that's being uh, built on the south side of 270 and to the north of us at New Pogue Road, um, together we have about roughly 25 million square feet. Um, once everybody is on the tax rolls, even if you froze it at 25 million feet, although there's plenty more to come, the property taxes for the area would be uh, $30 million a year, approximately. Um, and those, tax, those taxes will come in. There's an extremely low default rate, as you can imagine, on property taxes because uh, the county has high priority uh, in the pecking order of who gets paid. Uh, because property taxes have such a high status, the lien, it's, it, it's above the mortgage. And nobody wants to lose a uh, $50 million building because, I have to do some quick math here, uh, 
because they failed to pay um, a, a million dollar a year uh, property tax bill. Um, so going back to the beginning and kind of how this happened in a nutshell, uh, in the spring, how it kind of unfolded once we had all the uh, component parts together, uh, meaning the uh, support of the community, the enterprise zone and, and plans on our desks. So in the spring of 1997, we met representatives of Dial Corporation. Uh, we were standing on the shoulder of Highway 111, just south of Old Pogue Road, in the midst of uh, soybeans and corn stalks. Um, and I, I didn't really get why, at the time, why Dial wanted to be there so badly, but they did. And they hung in there uh, despite some obstacles that we ran into. Um, it was just so clear that they wanted to be there. I thought, you know, maybe there really is something here. Uh, and, and then what happened, which was completely outside our control, um, the supply chain experts decided that instead of having warehouses all over the country to serve their customers, industry to serve their customers, they should consolidate and do these really large re regional warehouses, which would what you see by and large in Gateway. So for example, Dial told us that they were gonna serve a 17 state region. This was their Midwest regional warehouse. Um, another example is Lowe's. Uh, Lowe's serves 100 at the time when they came into the park, uh, which would have been around 2015, they serve 122 stores. Uh, so, um, and, and one of the reasons why here, they're here also outside our control, besides this consolidation of smaller warehouses and the larger ones, another thing that happened that was good and what, which Lowe's kinds of, kind of serves as an example of, um, new trucking regulations were enacted and there are actually electronic logs that are uh, uh, connected to the, uh, the tractors. And if a driver drives beyond a certain number of hours a year, the engine shuts off. I'm sure they get some kind of warning so they're not stuck out in the middle of nowhere. So what Lowe's is doing is they're, it's hard to find truck drivers these days. There's a very large national shortage. You know, truck drivers used to leave on Sunday, drive out from say North Carolina to Denver, home on Thursday, have three days at home, head back out Sunday night. Uh, instead, Lowe's is saying, sleep in your own bed. You're gonna drive four and a half hours out from our warehouse, come back, and be done in nine hours, sleep in your own bed. Uh, so there are, that's just another consolidation, so to speak, that's happening in the industry that has been helpful to Gateway. Um, we did have obstacles we had to overcome. Uh, when we started out, I heard so many arguments. One was um, the workers' compensation rates are far too high in Illinois. Another was, well, the union labor work rules our uh, slow down productivity and that raises costs by too much. Um, another was, um, you know, Madison County has a kind of a history of litigation. Am I gonna be exposed to greater liability? Another was, uh, we're gonna come in and we're gonna turn all this farmland which absorbs water and serves as a, as a pond until it evaporates. Otherwise, if it doesn't seep into the soil, uh, you're gonna pave it and we're gonna have this major stormwater management problem. In fact, that appeared above the fold on the St. Louis Post-Dispatch early on. But in fact, our stormwater management plan, uh, actually, we actually reduced how much water was going into the, uh, the uh, county ditch and we've improved the stormwater uh, for our neighbors. And then another major obstacle we ran into was the soil. So you have high moisture soil, high plasticity, the soil expands and it contracts and that can lead to the slabs of the buildings cracking and sinking. So what we did to overcome that was we went out and we hired an expert in every area and we built our case. So for example, we went to the Belleville office of Thompson and Coburn and hired an expert in workers compensation law. He wrote a memo on why that would not be a problem here. We just kind of ticked through all the issues and when the issue would come up, we'd go, here's an expert who studied the issue, not a problem, one after the other. Um, we also had trouble getting the St. Louis commercial brokerage community to bring their tenants over here. Um, and um, 
It took a while. I'd say for three years, they did not even recognize our project in the um, in, in their annual presentations. But slowly but surely, we got one tenant after another. And now this is the big box location in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And anybody who comes to St. Louis with that need uh, is going to you know, want to be here. Um, so, um, so anyway, that is pretty much the story of Gateway in a nutshell. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have or uh, respond to any comments as well. Jerry, to ask oh. for a brief forecast on the next two to three years. Uh, forecast on what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting question because um, even though I said earlier that we're building out at the rate of one to two million square feet a year, you may have heard that commodity prices have skyrocketed. Steel has gone up, gosh, I bet 30 to 40 percent in about two months, and it's making it much more difficult to build these uh, cost effectively. And then the question is, will the market absorb the in increased rents we have to charge to get a decent return on investment? Um, so I think in a micro sense, what's going on in St. Louis uh, and uh, what the supply demand balance is, I think we'll continue to build at this clip. And it's not just us, there are other developers in the, park, in the area now, in the park and across the street. I think that will continue. And I think the reason it will continue is that COVID dramatically accelerated e-commerce sales. So people who are selling product and want to get it to your, to your doorstep or still to the stores, they've had to redo their supply chains. And that has caused a tremendous amount of increased demand for new modern warehouse space. And, and I think this area will get its share. And I think they will absorb uh, the increased costs. We have time for one more. Is there any historical information of what these companies do once their tax basis are gone? Do they leave? Do they stay? Or do they have long term lease agreements with the cap? Once the tax abatements uh, are done with, uh, what's history say about these companies staying? That's a great question because when we first started Gateway and we got tax abatement, we were challenged by that question. Will companies simply leave? Uh, building where the tax abatement has expired and move to a new one and take advantage of it all over again. And the simple answer is that no tenant, not a single one, has moved from one building in Gateway to another. However, I want to make sure I answer this accurately. Worldwide Technologies moved from Gateway up to Lakeview at New Pogue Road in 111 for I think it was 10 years. They did not move because of tax abatement. Uh, they moved because their needs changed. And then they added facilities back in Gateway. And then there's a small tenant, QPSI, that moved from Gateway to south of 270 uh, because they got pushed out of their building. And I think, and by the way, not a single tenant has left the Gateway submarket in, in 24 years. And I think we've come to learn, there's some stickiness there. I think the workforce is appreciated and it's also very expensive to move. Michael, on behalf of Edwardsville Rotary, we wanna thank you for your program and your presentation today. It's been very informative. Good. And your contribution to the community. So I think thank that's you. a great round of applause. Okay, uh, Abel's 